a student of the role of religion, specifically Christianity, in the American founding era. And when I speak of the founding era, I'm talking about the last third or so of the 18th century. This is the time when the American colonists declare their independence from Great Britain, and they fight a war for independence. And then having secured independence, they have the, the difficult task of creating new constitutional republics in the aftermath of that war. And among those constitutions is that document that was drafted in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. And in the brief time that we have together this morning, I, I want to reflect on a biblical phrase, a phrase that I think will shed light on the American conceptions of liberty in this founding era. This is a phrase that will give us some insight on human flourishing. My, my goal today is not so much to lay out an argument or to set forth a plan of action. Rather, what I want to do in our minutes together is to paint a picture for you. What does flourishing look like? What does human flourishing look like? And the picture I hope to paint for you today, one that is drawn from our scriptural text this morning, I think will help us answer this question. In particular, I want to meditate on a biblical metaphor, a metaphor that appears frequently in the political literature of the founding era. It is the words of an ancient Hebrew blessing and a prophetic vision of a new Jerusalem. This is a time when Every man will sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree. Now this, interestingly, was George Washington's favorite scriptural phrase. Like most gentlemen of his time and his social standing, Washington was well acquainted with the eloquent prose of the King James Bible. And we read from the Green King James this morning because this is the English language translation that Americans at the end of the 18th century would have been reading. And Washington knew this Bible. He knew it well. Uh, he know, knew by heart long passages from the King James Bible. And he makes countless allusions and references to this text in his writings and in his speeches. And no biblical passage is referenced more frequently in Washington's voluminous papers than this ancient Hebrew blessing. And what is it? It's an image of a man reposing under his own vine and fig tree. This captures the agrarian ideals of simplicity, contentment, domestic tranquility, and self-sufficiency. Now, in my preliminary survey of Washington's papers... Uh, I have found that he quotes this, this passage of Scripture nearly 50 times during the last half of his life. Most, but not all, of these references were made in private letters, letters written in anticipation to his retirement to Mount Vernon, his, his beloved home on the south bank of the Potomac River. And Washington, it should be noted, was not alone among his contemporaries in his attraction to this particular passage of Scripture. We're going to find many, many other references in the literature of the era to this vine and fig tree. And again, what do we have? An image of a man dwelling under this vine and fig tree. It appears three times in the Old Testament. We find it in Micah chapter 4, again in 1 Kings chapter 4, and Zechariah chapter 3. It's also mentioned once in the books uh, that we sometimes call the Apocrypha. And Washington would surely have been familiar with all of these different uses of the vine and fig tree that we find in the Old Testament. But if you look carefully at the particular phraseology that Washington uses, it's very evident that he's quoting from Micah chapter 4, verse 4. And so the question I want to put before us at this moment is, what is it about this particular biblical passage that appealed to George Washington? What does his frequent recurrence to this Hebrew blessing tell us about his character, about his values? And we could say the same, ask the same question of his contemporaries who were similarly drawn to this text. Now, George Washington is remembered today largely as a soldier and a statesman. However, it, it's his life as a farmer, a career of his own choosing that truly captured his imagination. 
and gave him greater fulfillment than either his life in the military or in politics. His plantation at Mount Vernon inspired his affection for the land and and his agricultural pursuits. Mount Vernon, I think we can truly say, was George Washington's vine and fig tree. And although his public duties often necessitated long absences from Mount Vernon, it was never far from his mind. It was always something he was thinking about. And his many references to Micah 4.4 are laced with this nostalgia for Mount Vernon and for a return to a happier, more tranquil time, a time filled with agricultural pursuits, the pursuits that brought him so much satisfaction and so much pleasure. This is evident, for example, in a letter he wrote in April 1797. And let me just point out, this is a letter he writes literally within days of having returned to Mount Vernon, having spent eight years as President of the United States. And so he writes in this letter, and I quote, I am once more seated under my own vine and fig tree and hope to spend the remainder of my days in peaceful retirement, making political pursuits yield to the more rational amusement of cultivating the earth, end quote. Now, We've looked here uh, in our scripture reading at at Micah chapter 4, verse 4 in its larger context. And so I I want us to sort of walk through once again this passage that we have just heard. Uh, Let me just say that the millennial vision of a new Jerusalem that we read here in Micah chapter 4 distills with striking beauty and brevity, the highest aspirations of humankind. Few passages in all of scripture, indeed I would say in all of literature, capture so eloquently the human longing for peace and contentment and prosperity that we see described here. The prophet Micah ministered at a time when the nation Israel was constantly facing threats from neighboring empires. And there were, during the seasons of his life, wars between Israel and its neighbors. And in Micah 4, what we see here is a vision, a glorious vision of Jerusalem's future, a time when God's plan for history has been fulfilled. And so there in verses 1 and 2, we read, the house of the Lord is established on Mount Zion. And in these last days described in this text, the people and the nations of the world will be drawn to the mountain of the Lord, we read, to receive divine instruction. God will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. God's law shall go forth. There will be a turning away from all other gods. Then we get to verse 3 where we are told that God will arbitrate disputes among the peoples and nations of the world. And then there's this beautiful passage that we're all familiar with. Nations, we read, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. This is the picture of this new Jerusalem. This is a time when God's perfect justice is dispensed. Enmity is set aside. Fear is banished. This is a picture of shalom, the way things were designed to be. This is a perfectly ordered, fully restored existence. Now, I haven't actually seen this, but I am told that over one of the main entrances of the headquarters of the United Nations in New York City are engraved these words about nations beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. But let me say here, in the most emphatic language I can find, that the peace that's being described here is not the peace of human diplomacy. Rather, this is the work of the Prince of Peace. The horror of war will become a thing of the past when the Prince of Peace is enthroned on Mount Zion. And then we reach verse 4. In this new Jerusalem, governed by the peace, Prince of Peace, every man shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree. And we can, can, be, we can be confident 
that this vision will one day become a reality. Why? Because there at the end of that verse we read, because the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. Now the security, the serenity, the prosperity of this future age are illustrated by the vine and fig tree. And although this is a picture of the last days, there's a, there's a kind of nostalgia an idealization in these words. We could easily dismiss this picture of sometime in the future as pure utopia, and it will never happen. But the prophet Micah does something very interesting here. In using this language of the vine and fig tree, he's actually hearkening back to a description of Israel during the reign of King Solomon that we read about in chapter 4 of 1 King, when in fact, for a brief moment, for a season of time, Israel enjoyed a time of remarkable peace and prosperity. So do you see what the prophet's doing here? He's painting a picture of the future, one that we might dismiss as unrealistic. But he makes it seem possible by bringing our attention back to a moment in the past when we had a small taste of what this future age would be like. And so suddenly the unrealistic seems possible. And I think this is one of the reasons why this passage of Scripture has appealed to so many people down through the ages. Now, the, the images themselves of a vine and of a fig tree are interesting. They're, they're rich symbols that we find throughout Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we could spend a very long time just, just talking about what the symbolic significance are of these two Plants. But let me just say very briefly, both the grape and the fig represent sustaining life, vitality, fertility. They are blessings. And what's really interesting is that you can go to the Middle East today and you can see where families will grow and they will plant and they will grow a fig tree and then they will train a vine to grow up the trunk of that fig tree. And this too collectively has symbolic significance. It is a symbol of a time of extended peace and prosperity because it takes many years to grow a fig tree and then grow a vine and train it to grow up that trunk. And so when we see these two together, we're seeing a picture of extended continuity, stability, and prosperity. So the images of the vine and fig tree were rich with meaning for the prophet Micah's audience. They are symbols deeply ingrained in the Jewish tradition, and they similarly resonated with George Washington, the Virginia farmer who loved the earth and its fruits. The vine and fig tree represented everything that attracted Washington to the land and drew him home time and again to Mount Vernon. So once again, why is this biblical passage so appealing to Washington? Well, the prophetic text here addresses themes of vital and enduring importance to Washington. Washington the citizen, Washington the farmer, Washington the warrior, Washington the statesman. These ancient words embody a reassuring message of freedom from want, freedom from fear, and in the American experience, a respect for religious liberty. So let's look a little bit more closely at these great themes emerging from this text. First, this metaphor of the vine and fig tree represents freedom from want. Freedom from want. The image of a man sitting undisturbed in safety under his own vine and fig tree is a picture of contentment. Contentment is to be free from want. It is the opposite of greed, envy, covetousness. And the Bible instructs the believer to be content with such things as ye have. And so in Micah chapter 4, we see this agrarian ideal of a simple and modest existence, of neither desiring nor acquiring more than one's own produce, and of respecting the fruits of your neighbor's labor. It implies being content with your own vine and fig tree, without yearning for or coveting the vines and the figs which others produce. This is a radical vision given what we know of human nature. It is a repudiation of a culture of materialism and consumerism, being content with what you have. 
There can be no peace so long as people consume far beyond their means, covet a neighbor's belongings to satisfy their own rapacious appetites. And so long as many nations use swords and spears to take what rightfully belongs to others. Few fears threaten one's contentment and security more than the fear of being homeless. Shelter under the spacious leaves of one's own vine and fig tree promises freedom from the fear of homelessness. One's home provides not only shelter, but a sense of belonging, refuge, solace, security, and comfort. In Mount Vernon, Washington's vine and fruit tree provided a welcome retreat from the hustle and the bustle of his very public life. And his papers attest that Washington regarded Mount Vernon as such a retreat. The vine and fig tree can also be seen as a metaphor for hospitality and good neighborliness. This is especially evident of the rendering of this metaphor in Zechariah chapter 3. And hospitality, of course, is a virtue encouraged in Scripture. We read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 10, Romans 12, and Hebrews 13, just for some examples. And hospitality was a virtue liberally practiced by George and Martha Washington. And Washington often used the phrase to extend hospitality. He would write letters to friends, inviting them come and, and spend some time at Mount Vernon and enjoy his hospitality by saying, come and spend some time under my vine and fig tree. Washington's hospitality did not falter despite the overwhelming crush of visitors to Mount Vernon. It's been estimated that during the seven years between 1768 and 1775, roughly 2,000 people were entertained at Mount Vernon, many of whom stayed for days on end and visited repeatedly. In April of 1774, a rather typical month, an average of four to five guests joined the Washingtons every time they sat down for dinner. Indeed, George and Martha Washington, we are told, only dined alone. They only dined alone twice in the last 20 years of their marriage. Imagine, imagine your life if you extended hospitality in such measure. In the wider literature of the age, the vine and fig tree was sometimes used as a metaphor for a tolerant immigration policy. It was also a familiar metaphor for the blessing of enjoying private property. Notice how this is sometimes rendered, sitting under your own vine and under your own fig tree. Again, recognizing the blessings of possessing and using your own property. Freedom from fear. Freedom from fear is a second component of this blessing. The vine and fig tree, as previously noted, are traditional Jewish symbols of peace and prosperity. Moreover, the blessing of Micah 4.4 continues with that comforting assurance, and none shall make them afraid. This promise echoes the ancient blessing that we read in Leviticus 26.6. It describes a life free from war and rumors of war, a life beyond the reach of anxiety and worry about tomorrow. This is liberation from terror today and from the threat of disturbance tomorrow. And when it read in conjunction with the preceding description of the New Jerusalem in which, in which nations shall, not, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, the blessing more specifically entails freedom from the fear of war. And surely, surely this appealed to the old warrior, General Washington. For few pray so earnestly for peace and safety as those who have known war. More generally, the vine and fig tree motif represents the security to produce and enjoy produce unmolested, either by lawlessness or the usurpations of the state. Commentators through the ages have seen in this passage the necessity for rule of law, the protection of one's vine and fig trees from lawlessness. They've also seen in this text a repudiation of statism or big government. A society unbounded by law and civil order threatens all vines and fig trees with theft and plunder. 
The objective of a good government, late 18th century Americans often said, was to ensure that every citizen could dwell in safety under his own vine and fig tree. A state system that claims and consumes and devours every fig from every fig tree and every grape from every vine is a terror, is a terror to the citizen sitting under his own vine and fig tree. A big government which taxes excessively, spends voraciously, confiscates private property, stifles innovation through excessive regulation, and infringes personal liberties, threatens the security and the contentment of life under one's vine and fig tree. I want to draw your attention to a third theme, a third theme. The founding generation and those who followed frequently connected freedom of religion with the vine and fig tree motif. And interestingly, this seems to be an American innovation of this metaphor in literature and in biblical interpretation. And let me give you a couple illustrations of of how the founding generation would have connected life under the vine and fig tree with religious liberty. The Presbyterian minister, Ezra Evans, one of the Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon's pupils and John Ma- John Ma- James Madison's classmate at the College of New Jersey, remarked in a 1791 speech, and I quote, O oh, happy people who live in this land and in this age of religious liberty. Here in America, every man has equally the freedom of choosing his religion and may sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And on account of religion, none shall make them afraid, end quote. Or here's another example. This is from Thomas Baldwin. He was the Baptist minister of Second Baptist Church in Boston. And in a Thanksgiving Day speech in the mid-1790s, he says this, and I quote, We are a people highly favored of the Lord, Our religious privileges are none of the least. We sit under our own vine and fig tree, and none are permitted to disturb or make us afraid. We worship God according to the dictates of our own consciences without the dread of an inquisition or fear of persecution. I could give you many more examples, but I want to give you one more, and this is an important one. This comes again from George Washington. In an eloquent letter he wrote in 1790. It's a letter he wrote to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. And again, what we're going to see here is Washington connecting the vine and the fig tree with religious liberty. And some have said, and I think there's good reason to say that this is perhaps Washington's most important letter he ever wrote. And so indulge me if I read a few lines from it and then Let's, let's think about what he's saying. So I quote, The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree and there shall be none to make him afraid." End quote. Now let's look a little bit more deeply at this text because he's saying something here that's profound. In fact, I would say that what Washington does in this letter is he articulates Americans' greatest contribution to political thought and to political society. And what is that thought? He is saying in America we have abandoned a state policy of religious toleration and we have embraced in its place a policy of religious liberty. Now let's think about that for a moment. 
What's the difference between a policy of state toleration and religious liberty? In a regime of toleration, we assume there, that there is a human institution that in its benevolence says you can practice your religion. But if a state institution says to you, you can practice your religion, what can that state institution also do? Take it away. Take it away. And what Washington is saying here is we've embarked on a different experiment. We don't put toleration in the hands of the state. Rather, we view religious liberty as a natural, inherent, inalienable right that's beyond the reach of civil government. Religious liberty is a gift of God. And that which God gives us, man and government cannot take away. Religious liberty is under assault in America today. The civil state is reverting to the old regime of toleration, abandoning a commitment to religious liberty that views the free exercise of religion as a natural inherent right. This is the challenge of our age. Increasingly, the civil state tolerates only those religious exercises and expressions of faith that conforms to the values and the policies of the secular state. Religious liberty, rightly and historically understood, is premised on a belief that believers owe an allegiance and obedience to God in addition to their responsibilities to civil government. Religious liberty is also premised on the belief that one's religion and one's conscience are matters that lie solely between the individual and God, that one owes account to none other than to God for your faith and your conscience. Human flourishing demands that the state respect and preserve the rights of conscience free from government coercion. But this is a vision of religious liberty increasingly rejected by state officials, by government officials in, in Sacramento, Sacramento in Washington, D.C. The policies of the civil state threatening religious liberty today commands that we bring religious beliefs and pop practices into conformity with the preferences of the secular state, the effect of which is to neutralize or silence the prophetic voice and witness of our faith when it critiques or dissents from the prevailing orthodoxies of our secular age. Make no mistake, make no mistake, the assault on religious liberty is a deliberately designed to either silence the religious voice in the marketplace of ideas or coerce the community of faith to conform to the interests of the secular state, even when those interests are at odds with the dictates of our faith and our conscience. As believers, we are counter-cultural agents in our secular world. The witness of our faith will unavoidably challenge, critique, and irritate the prevailing secular orthodoxies of our culture. No matter the pressures to conform, no matter the cost, we must remain faithful to the dictates of our faith and our conscience, regardless of whether or not government respects our religious liberty and the rights of our consciences. The religious liberty we have enjoyed in this land is a precious gift, a gift of God and among the blessings of life under the vine and fig tree. It is proper that we should be alarmed at the efforts to narrow, to redefine, or even take away this liberty. I encourage you, be attentive to what's at stake in the current debates over the meaning and application of religious liberty and liberty of conscience. Be vigilant, I pray, in your defense of this precious gift of religious liberty. So in closing, it's my prayer that each and every one of you will enjoy God's richest blessings under the vine and fig tree. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.